Father in your heaven, once again we come to thy presence, Lord, thanking you for giving us this privilege to come together and to discuss your word and learn your word, learn your word, oh. word, Lord. Lord, help us to grow in the knowledge of your Son Jesus Christ, and we may grow in His grace as well. The time we spend in learning, in discussing, Lord, may be a fruitful time which edifies each and every one who is present here, Lord. And our word, the words we speak, Lord, may be mutually beneficial and mutually encouraging, Lord. And everything we do may be acceptable in your sight. Help Pastor as he is going to speak your word and he is struggling uh, with a sore throat. And strengthen him, Lord, by your spirit. He may not face any difficulty, but... Uh, by your grace, Lord, smoothly he can deliver the word that you have installed for all of us, Lord. And we submit this time and especially pass it down into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Praveen. And <clears throat> once again, welcome to all of you joining us for study today. Uh, uh, as I explained, what we'll do is just go straight away into the article. Let's read through that whole thing and then we'll... we'll uh, uh, get back to some discussion. So let me share my screen. Uh, okay, now let me see. I mean, you'll have to tell me if uh, if it is basically okay, the size. Or do you want to increase? Um, you're on mute, Praveen. Can you? Uh, zoom in a little more. Okay. Is that all right? A little more. Okay, the problem is I've got my, I have to keep moving this. How do I move? No, you don't need to uh, press zoom in once again. Uh, I have this bar with the... Yeah, not that much, a little less. <laughs> okay. Press the minus there. You press the minus. Uh, minus, yeah. Yeah, now there is a bar, no, not that much, Pastor. Yeah, okay. There is a bar on, uh, above this uh, zoom in thing. There you adjust and bring it to the, keep it in the center. Oh, okay. All right, let me just see there. That's all. Is that okay? Yeah, I guess you can zoom in one more one more time. Right. Now I need to remove this. Uh, let yeah. me just see how I can. Uh, okay. Uh, I thumbnail. Okay. Uh, all right. So you are able to hear me. I can't see any of you because uh, <laughs> I've reduced my thumbnail thing. Uh, Praveen, is that okay? Yes, Pastor. Okay. I'm going ahead. Remember the, I mean, or rather, let me point you to the, uh, to the uh, title of the article uh, on uh, basically theology. Uh, and the title is what's so special about Trinitarian theology. And the reason I've selected this is Trinitarian theology has been our distinctive as a denomination. And I thought maybe it would be helpful for us to uh, read this, uh, the author being Mr. Uh, Dr. Joseph Tikach. Okay, I'm reading from line one. Learning more about the nature of God has dominated my Bible study for the last decade. I find it to be more and more fascinating. Having the correct perspective of who God is cannot be overestimated. Viewing his sovereignty over eternity and the nature of his being orders all of our doctrinal understandings. I love the following quote from Charles Spurgeon, England's best known preacher for most of the second half of the 19th century. Okay, let me just get this thing. Okay, the highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings and the existence of the great God whom he calls his father. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity 
so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. <clears throat> I am sometimes asked, what's so special about Trinitarian theology? Don't most Orthodox churches believe in the Trinity? Yes, they do. But uh, rather, belief in the Trinity is considered the hallmark of <clears throat> authentic Christian doctrine. It free from being considered a cult. As I studied what various churches believe about the Trinity, I observed that while most consent to the doctrine does not have a central role in their faith, many consider Trinity is not at the center shaping all other doctrines, strange ideas and distortions arise. For example, those who proclaim a health, wealth, prosperity gospel tend to view God as a divine vending machine. Others tend to view God as a mechanistic version of fate who has determined everything from before creation, including who will be saved and who will be damned. I find it hard to accept a God who creates billions of people just for the purpose of condemning and damning them for eternity. <clears throat> Trinitarian theology puts the Trinity at the center of all doctrinal understanding, influencing everything we believe and understand about God. As theologian Catherine Lacoub now wrote in her book for us, The doctrine of the Trinity is ultimately a teaching not about the abstract nature of God, nor, nor about God in isolation from everything other than God, <clears throat> but a teaching about God's life with us and our life with each other. Trinitarian theology could be described as par excellence, a theology of relationship, which explores the mysteries of love, relationship, personhood and communion within the framework of God's self-revelation in the person of Christ and the activity of the spirit. And let me read that note that he makes. While I appreciate much of what is in the book, I don't agree with all of it. We know of this triune life of God from Jesus, who is God's self-revelation in person. It should be our rule that anything we say about the Trinity must come from Jesus's life, teaching, death, resurrection, ascension, and promised return. Okay. Uh, you can see the diagram there, but I will go past it. And uh, maybe uh, you may just uh, take a mental picture of it because there'll be reference to it. But let me continue reading. <clears throat> I have seen many diagrams that attempt to explain the Trinity. The best of them fall short and some are confusing. It is impossible to explain the nature of God in a diagram. However, a good one can help us grasp some aspects of the doctrine. You may find help for the diagram shown at right. It summarizes early church teaching, pointing out that correct biblical understanding concerning the nature of God upholds three essential beliefs about God. It also indicates that we end up denying that God is triune when even one of these beliefs is rejected. The three sides of the triangle in the diagram represent three essential beliefs. All right, if uh, just to give you some context, let me go back to that. Notice it says that the three sides of the triangle in the diagram, all right, the, si the sides, 
represent the three essential beliefs. If you see that in uh, bold, three persons, equality of persons, monotheism, those are the true beliefs. And the point of the triangle across each side represents the corresponding error when that particular belief is denied. What are the errors in this diagram? It is polytheism, subordin subordinationism, and modalism. All right, let me go back and read. Uh, point one here, uh, denial of the three persons results in modalism, sometimes referred to as the oneness teaching. The erroneous belief that God appears to us in three ways or modes, wears three hats, acts in three different roles, or just has three different names. The second bullet point, denial of the equality of persons results in subordinationism. The erroneous belief that one of the divine persons is less than fully and truly God. And the third uh, bullet point, denial of monotheism, the idea of the unity of God, results in polytheism, the erroneous belief in two or more separate gods including the error of tritheism, a belief in three gods. Okay. Um, coming down to the last two, uh, the four lines. When we are careful to uphold all three of these essential beliefs about God, we avoid the corresponding false teachings and thus bear faithful witness to the glorious mystery of the Trinity. I thank God for daily for answering our many prayers to reveal us uh, greater truth. He's revealing himself <coughs> to each of us as the triune God was a miraculous moment for each one of us. Uh, the article ends there and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make some comments and then um, I'll open it up for some discussion. All right, if I can just go back to the beginning of the article. In the first paragraph, uh, the last line, the fourth line, it says, viewing his sovereignty over eternity and nature of his being, and uh, this is what I'd like to highlight, orders all of our doctrinal understanding. So when you say what's so special about Trinitarian theology, understanding the nature of God or as much as we are able, as much as revealed to us is essential for all doctrinal understanding. Uh, for some reason, we have come to understand and believe that when you divorce the nature of God from certain doctrines, then we can uh, fall prey to error. So that is, you know, knowing who God is, is uh, what uh, helps us to formulate doctrine that are orthodox, that are true to the scriptures. You cannot have a doctrine that uh, can be antithetical to the very nature of God, you know, and we constantly keep repeating that the nature of God, I mean, the very essence of his nature is love. Anything that uh, violates that, then has, we have a problem. In the, uh, in the third uh, paragraph here, uh, one, two, three, third line after father, let me read to you this interesting uh, line. It says, there is something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divin divinity. Uh, this is a quotation from Charles Spurgeon. And uh, it's interesting how he uh, is articulates our uh, pursuit of understanding divinity, right? He says, there is something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. <clears throat> in other words, uh, 
I'm reminded of, uh, I think, is it Karl Marx or someone who said that religion is the opium of the people? Uh, was it Karl Marx or was it somebody else? I can't remember now. Uh, in other words, basically what he's saying is religion and if you are basically understanding or trying to understand God um, makes you a slave, makes you uh, less of a human. And that's what atheists like to believe. That belief in God is what causes all the problems in the world. They are uh, many of our new uh, militant atheists are very quick to say that religion is the cause for all the, you know, violence and uh, and uh, the various problems that we uh, face in the world. So uh, I thought it's good to make that contrast from what uh, you know Charles Spurgeon says. Um, okay, just let me go down a little bit more and let me take up this particular, uh, the, the paragraph right on top on your screen. Um, uh, one of the differences we, or what, one of our distinctives from most others with regards to the Trinity or the doctrine of Trinity is what Mr. Rikach mentions here. Notice he says, as I studied what various churches believe about the Trinity, I observed that while most consent to the doctrine, it does not have a central role in their faith. And that is what we already commented on earlier, that uh, uh, they divorce this fundamental understanding from their doctrinal uh, perspectives they tend to take some doctrine standalone without bringing it and tying it up with the nature of God. And I, and I think that is the distinctive that we as in GCI have. In this uh, same paragraph, uh, if you go to the third line, it starts with, this is sad because when the Trinity is not at the center, shaping all other doctrines, strange ideas and distortions arise, right? In other words, if you don't ground your belief system, your doctrinal uh, perspectives in the fundamental perspective or other belief of who God is, uh, God is misrepresented. God is, you know, completely misunderstood. And I think he gives some examples about how some people believe that he is like a vending machine. Some gospels preach that all you have to do with God is just please him and he will fulfill the desires of your heart, right? He is like a genie in a bottle, right? In other words, you can control God. This is the, uh, especially the heresy of the health, wealth, prosperity gospel, that you can control God by trying to appease him or please him or, or do all kinds or, or, or uh, you know, chant an incantation and you can control him. And that is something which uh, is a misrepresentation of the true God. Um, uh, another later in the same paragraph, he talks about the mechanistic version of fate where basically what it means is that uh, some believe humans have no real freedom. Humans were not created with a free will to decide for themselves if they will come into a relationship with God. And that is something maybe uh, the Calvinistic thought tends to highlight on or reformed theology. And uh, basically saying that God created many who will never, uh, you know, of their own free will accept God because they are, re, uh, they are degenerate, okay? They have no freedom to choose God. Okay, then uh, I will just go down to the next uh, page and pick up one more thought in this paragraph in the second line. Uh, it says, it is impossible to explain the nature of God in a diagram. And that is something that uh, we must keep in mind. All diagrams, all analogies, all comparisons of the true God to any kind of physicality will 
always fall short. So um, remember that we may try to, uh, you know, try to explain the, tr the triune nature of God, which is in one sense physically unexplainable, uh, by using certain analogies. And we have to be careful that by using certain analogies, you can actually introduce error into uh, how you understand God. So that is uh, something we want to keep in mind. Uh, and they all, all diagrams and analogies fall short of explaining God. So, um, so two points that I want to leave you with, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, to answer that question, which is posed in the article, what's so special about Trinitarian theology? Uh, one in my understanding is that the only way to reconcile who Jesus is, is to be able to recognize the, you know, Jesus from a Trinitarian perspective. Uh, denying the divinity of Jesus or, or thinking of him as only a created being, uh, uh, you know, is a problem. And that is how many have tried to find Trinitarianism very difficult. But the only way I feel we can explain the divinity of Jesus is Trinitarianism. And that makes a tremendous difference. And it is indeed very special. And one more thought, we learn about Trinitarianism from uh, the words of Jesus. He talked about his father. Uh, is this a separate God? Is this a God behind the back of Jesus, as some theologians will say? Uh, is Father a separate God from Jesus? Or is Father the only God? And Jesus is, uh, you know, not God? Well, these are problems that um, we will have to face without this doctrine. So, um, uh, what Jesus, the teachings of Jesus seem to be quite uh, categorical in terms of uh, God being Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, let me leave it there for now. And uh, I know we can talk many more things, um, but I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, is it okay if I stop sharing the screen or do you still want me to keep it on? Um, if there's any, any reference you want to make, uh, I'll tell you what, let me take it off for now and we'll come back. And uh, we, we'll go back to it in case it is necessary. Well, uh, your thoughts at this time? Yes, Anil, go ahead. You have to unmute uh, before you speak, Anil. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'm... Uh, <clears throat> I'm not really able to understand how does the belief in Trinitarianism prevent us from thinking that God is a vending machine or, you know, fatalistic God and so on. I mean, even if it is belief in one God, not Trinitarian, we can still believe him, uh, think of him as, you know, a vending machine. So how does Trinitarian prevent us from doing that? You, you know what I'm asking? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, uh, you're saying uh, understanding God as Trinity will not stop us from misrepresenting him. In, 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 in a general way, that is absolutely true. You can still misrepresent him like so many Trinitarian theologians have. Mm -hmm. They have uh, completely missed the, the, the main point of the Trinity like we saw in the diagram, polytheism, Subordination, subordinationism and modalism, right? So yes, uh, you yes you can uh, what do you say uh, misrepresent God even with a trinitarian understanding. Uh, what I would like to say is perhaps uh, it may be it 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 might reduce the uh, likelihood of getting into how, how we could still think of God as three in one and still a vending machine. <laughs> Okay, okay. I think, I, 
Yeah, you're stuck with the vending machine thing. So you are. No, I mean, or any, or any other uh, view of God. We, uh, uh, how does Trinitarian specifically sort of, uh, you know, prevent us from doing that? That yes, he's Trinitarian, therefore he cannot be uh, anything else or, you know, at our beck and call or at our demand. Uh, okay. Uh, just to bring in that vending machine, uh, you know, thing, um, the way I would look at it is like this. When you understand God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit and his nature being love, it is love that is, uh, you know, the dynamic in them. God is love, right? Uh, in other words, God blesses us not because we can manipulate him. He blesses us because it is his very nature to bless. It is no. his very, what do you say, uh, it, it flows out of him. So if you think that I have to do something to get God to, you know, to cash in on God, then it, that is a misrepresentation of who God is, right? Does that help, Anil? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, no, I understand that. But what, no, my question is specifically, <clears throat> how does this uh, belief in the Trinity, <clears throat> you know, avoid us <clears throat> thinking of him as anything, you know, at a beck and call or vending machine or a fatalistic God has already decided. We can think of these even as he's, if he's just one person or if he's 10 persons. Right. So, right. Specifically, how is Trinitarian helping us in avoiding that belief? Okay. Once again, I think I'll, I'll appeal to what I said earlier. Trinitarianism helps us to understand who God is. And once again, I'll come back and say he's love, right? Now, uh, it is that which will help us recognize that, you know, he can't create billions of people only for destruction. Right? If he is love, that is against his very nature to condemn people to death. All right, So it will prevent you from thinking or the, the, the typical Calvinistic thinking that he damned some people, you know, he predestined some to, to damnation. So in that respect, it prevents, I mean, it, it prevents that misrepresentation. Okay, so what I would say is, Recognize Trinitarian theology from the very essence and na essential nature of God, that is love. And anything against his uh, nature, which is love, can, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately uh, lead to mis misrepresentation. I think that is, that is probably the catchphrase. Yeah, because, I mean, because he is love, there has to be somebody to love, right? And that's why... Uh, you know, three in one, Jesus and and yeah. and that's why he expresses his love, and that's why that love overflows to us, and therefore he cannot be, you know, anything else but uh, to love us. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good question, though. Right. I don't know if Praveen wants to add anything to that. Uh, Yeah, uh, as we're talking about Trinitarian theology, two words I would like to bring to your notice. Your, your notice. Both were used actually. We are not just talking about the doctrine of Trinity. We are talking about Trinitarian theology, otherwise Trinitarianism. What does it mean is uh, Trinitarianism derives the implications of the doctrine of Trinity. So, number one thing, when we talk about doctrine of Trinity, it is not ju just about believing uh, three persons, one God, one God in three persons only. It is uh, this one God in three persons or three persons in one God are revealing something very essential about his very nature. That is relational. He is a relational God. He is a God of love. So, once we understand he is a God of love, we realize God does what he does because he is who he is so that is number one number two thing our dealing with him also will be influenced because we are not dealing with just a supreme leader in the world 
but we are dealing with a with someone who is relational who is love and who related to us in the same time in the same way so and he expects us also to relate in the same way so what happens is the way we relate to him changes the way we look at him changes the way we relate to him changes so uh with, that's what trinitarianism is talking about trinitarian theology is talking about it is bringing all the implications of god being three persons and one god so what happens is when we understand this uh, uh when we understand uh, uh about uh, just for an example in a family when we think about parents and children if we just, the way we relate to a master is different the way we relate to our father is different when we relate to our master we consider more of in a business terms and we want to earn whatever we want to and we consider him work more do more please him to uh, and uh, you get, uh, earn more but when it comes to the father we don't work in that sense we work uh, in a sense like in a complete dependency in complete trust we work and in relational sense we like to uh, we will have our expectations on him it is not like how uh, the uh, you know how we please him so that we can earn something from him uh, that is number one regarding the vending mission thing what you have uh, said and another thought what was already clarified that when we understand the nature of god it helps us to understand what he has for us we when we understand god only we understand what he is looking for her for us the according to that only we understand the salvation what is salvation for calvinism the center theme is god has chosen some people to go to hell some people to go to heaven but when when you come to trinitarianism it changes god is love in that sense he is not someone who is going to do that and we changes the nature of salvation itself in uh, in uh, calvinism the nature of salvation is going to heaven and living eternally but in <laughs> trinitarianism uh, nature of salvation is not just going to heaven nature of salvation is entering into the very relationship of god where uh, we are calling god as father as jesus was calling him. jesus so that how we are entering into a eternal relationship it is not just about going to heaven so whether we go to heaven or not that doesn't matter but we enter into the eternal relationship so it changes the nature of the salvation itself it changes the nature of church itself it changes the nature of everything that we live about so we are not talking about just god being three persons and one god and keeping that thought in a corner of our head but taking the implications of that particular thing so that's what trinitarian theology and trinitarianism about does it make any sense yes if i can just add before anyone uh, make a comment uh, yeah that's very helpful uh, praveen it is very necessary for us to to uh, separate the doctrine of the trinity and trinitarian theology the trinitarian theology you know is derived from the doctrine so uh, if i can just add one more thought there um uh, when we don't understand god from a trinitarian perspective our relationship with him is fear based right and if you notice most belief systems are basically fear based and that is where christianity departs with a trinitarian understanding it is love or relational based you know fear is uh you know is makes you to want to manipulate you have to be you know you want to appease but that's not the god we worship we are not trying to appease him because you cannot appease him there's nothing you can give him to satisfy his whatever you know wrath or anything uh, so fear based is what most you know uh, religions faiths tend to uh, follow but a trinitarian perspective brings in the love thought i'll just add that to what uh, praveen said yeah i think a simple way to put it is trinitarian trinitarianism uh relates to relationalism i mean that's exactly what it is about god wants a relationship with you he has a relationship within the trinity and which is what he expects to give us and expect of us 
Right. So, Trinitarian equates relation. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and relationship that is, that is undergirded by love, uh, not by contract or agreement or uh, fear mm -hmm. or any of that stuff. Right. You can, have a, you can have a relationship that is purely contractual, you know, but this is that's why we call him father. And, uh, you know, we understand a relationship in a family is different from, like Praveen said, uh, different from a business relationship. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts? Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Uh, you unmute. are on mute, uh, Franklin. Could you unmute yourself? Yeah. So, in that, uh, going back to the Charles Spurgeon's quote, you know, sir. Yes. Uh, whom he calls father, the word he refers to whom, sir? Uh, obviously, Jesus. That's it. Let me just see here. Uh, the quote from Charles Spurgeon. Right. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I feel he, you know. Uh, it is his reference to Jesus. Or let me see. Did you read no. that quote? Uh, yeah, I think it is basically a, a child of God, any disciple, right? Uh, let, let me just read it to you. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy, which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, and the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his father. So it's a reference to the child, uh, children. Yeah, any anyone who is a disciple of uh, Jesus who believe in right. believe in God as a father. Okay. Right. Yes, I, I realized that this uh, this topic always is a heavy one, and, and uh, uh, it is difficult sometimes to wrap our mind around it. But I think uh, the way we in GCI try to, you know, uh, our focus is not trying to explain three in one, uh, but you know, because you cannot fully satisfactory explainer in, a, in, a, in, in our dimensional world. But our focus is on what that means to us. The fact that I think Anil, you mentioned, if God is love, he had, he, he had to, and he, he, he needed someone or the... <laughs> his love would have began only when he created human beings. Hmm. Right? So in other words, he was not love before his creation. So that, that creates a big problem. That means God is not eternally love. Right. And if he was not love before his creation, is it possible that he'll stop being love sometime in the future? <laughs> and that's the reason why the Bible says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can trust him because of his faithfulness uh, in the perspective of love. I hope that makes uh, some sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Well, um, if you have no more questions, uh, we can end early, but before we end, um, what did you think about this method of study when we can take a good scholarly article and do some reading? Of course, my reading took about 15 minutes and have a little longer article, but then focus, you know, you, you tend to, uh, to uh, the focus can be a little uh, difficult. But uh, can I get some comments on uh, doing something like this in this year? Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's a good idea. Okay. Yes, Sunimurti, go ahead. Uh, 
I I would prefer a method. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I would prefer a method where we take up unclear passages in the Bible and to explain them if if there is no controversy. Yeah. Yes. There are so uh, many passages. There are so many passages, thousands of them, which are not clear. Hmm. We may take up at least one a week. <laughs> yes, I think uh, that is that is helpful because we used to call them difficult scriptures, uh, and we try to explain them. But that could be one of the methods we can adopt along with others. Is that okay? <laughs> Yes, sir. that's why I said one once, at least once a week. Yeah, once a month, perhaps you mean? Yeah, yeah. Bible study is only month. once a week, anyway. <laughs> Sorry, once a month. Okay, uh, we can do a little bit, bit of a mix-up, but uh, yeah, yeah. When we have a series, but I don't know. I mean, do you think it's okay? Sometimes we can have a break from a series and then continue later. We can have that also. Why not? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Suri Murthy. A series becomes monotonous. Okay. Um, yeah. If it is too long, it becomes monotonous. I guess, um, you know, you tend to lose some bit of interest, but... Um, well, maybe we should keep it short, but then <laughs> some series you need to justify study. You need, uh, you know, uh, several sessions. Yeah. It depends on the topic or, or, the, or the subject that you choose as a series. Some can be long, some can be short. Maybe a short series. <laughs> Not a long series. You have attention deficit syndrome, is it, Surya? That is, that is right. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> I agree. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I was also suggesting, in fact, Praveen and I are trying to work out on a plan for 22 and see what all we can do in the study. Uh, I was thinking maybe take a book study, which once again will, uh, will be voluminous. Uh, but what we can do is we can, rather than going verse by verse, we can take a themat thematic study of a book, you know, so that it doesn't become too long. Maybe a four-part series of a thematic study of a book. Uh, for example, the book of John, you know, the Gospel of John is a fantastic study in terms of the themes there. So, I don't know, we, we were thinking about that, we'll come back to you on it. Yeah. Yes, to Surimuthi? Uh, uh... I would like a session on Isaiah 53. Okay. Okay. So, Since you, yeah, go ahead. Because the Jews also read Isaiah 53. They do not accept Jesus Christ. Right. And we read Isaiah 53 and we look for a salvation by Jesus Christ. So where are we misunderstanding? Right. No, no misunderstanding. <laughs> we believe that you don't believe. Where is the misunderstanding? <laughs> yeah. Maybe he wants to know why the Jews don't believe that. <laughs> no, I, I know why they don't believe. But what we should do, how we should understand. Because right. there are problems. It says, says things in the past. Past tense. He was pierced. It is not talking about the future. Some problems like that. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to mention that actually. Um, some of you might have questions like what Suri Murthy has uh, posed. And it would be nice to get some of those questions. You can put it, put it in our WhatsApp group. And we can collect those questions. And sometime down the line, we can maybe just take a session to, to discuss your questions, you know, your, uh, not from, a, from the study itself, but from some other uh, readings that you may have done. So uh, just keep that in mind. Whenever you have any questions, you can jot them down and then send it across. Yes. 
other than that, uh, uh, I think we have done well for the day. Uh, thank you again for all of you for joining us. We'll come back to you and give you a plan for 2022 so that at least you can be anticipating what, or, you know, the way we will cover things. And uh, uh, we want to make it as, uh, what do you say, substantial, beneficial, helpful as possible, and obviously applicable. Uh, it, uh, it will have a, a lot of academic theoretical perspectives, but then on the other hand, it must also gel with you know, our situation today. So uh, we'll come back to you on that. Having said that, let's, uh, shall we close in prayer? If I can request our elder, Mr. Franklin Poppins, if he can lead us in the closing prayer today. Gracious Lord, our loving Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and privilege you have granted us to come together to raise our questions, ask clarifications, and look into the, your word. Thank you so much, Father. Lord, we remember, Lord, your admonition to grow in the knowledge and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I understand that growing in maturity takes time. It takes effort. Lord, we ask, Lord, that your presence continue to be with each and every one of us who have been coming so faithfully over the years. Lord, open our hearts and minds. Because, Lord, in the ultimate analysis, spiritual truth is something that only you can impart. It is not gained through five senses. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we ask your presence be with every one of us and even those who like to attend but are unable to attend. Very specially, Lord, we want to commit our pastor, Praveen, and all our leaders, Lord, who study and share. Lord, that you will inspire them and fill them with the double portion of your Holy Spirit so that, Lord, they are able to provide the leadership that is so vital in a growing challenging, secular world. Lord, be with every one of us, Lord. Whatever our stage of spirituality, Lord, strengthen us and may we grow into a deeper and a stronger relationship with you day by day so that, Lord, together with our brothers, sisters, we worship you and learn. Thank, thank you, Father. We ask your loving presence with all of us. In Jesus' precious name, we ask all this. Amen.